Great. Okay, so you're ready for me to uh, get started? Great. Terrific. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm absolutely delighted to be here uh, virtually, albeit. Uh, thanks for allowing me to be here remotely. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to talk about cryptocurrency uh, in the age of mass surveillance. Uh, so I want to start with a photo that I really think underscores uh, the ideas here. Um, this is a picture from the Hong Kong protests, and it shows the long lines at the subway stations that there were when there were pro-democracy protesters, and they're waiting to purchase tickets with cash because they don't want their electronic purchases to place them at the scene of the protest. So for me, this really underscores the importance of the ability to transact anonymously. Um, for me, this underscores that a cashless society is a surveillance society. Um, and for me, this underscores why cryptocurrency in particular is important. Uh, for me, cryptocurrency is important for civil liberties precisely because it imports the anonymity of cash into the online world. And this is, in my view, a feature and not a bug. There are a lot of people who disagree with me. And, you know, I think one could say reasonable minds can differ here. Um, but I think one of the big conception misconceptions that I see in the debate around financial transactions and privacy is this idea that anonymity is bad and that tools that enhance privacy uh, enable crime. Privacy and anonymity are not bad or illegal in the United States. They are, in my view, essential for civil liberties. Uh, they're essential for free expression and they're essential for the right of free association. And this is especially true for financial transactions. Financial records contain a trove of sensitive information about people's personal lives, their beliefs, and their affiliations. And uh, the refrain that cryptocurrency facilitates crime is, is simply wrong. Um, the idea that a technology could be used to violate the law does not mean that there is something wrong with the technology. Uh, notably, criminals have long used cash to commit crimes, but um, you don't necessarily hear uh, U.S. Congress mem members asking for a, a ban on cash uh, as a result of that. And we don't blame Ford when one of its cars is used as a getaway vehicle in a bank robbery. Um, so I wanted to start there just by, by setting the stage for how I really like to think about uh, anonymity and the importance of anonymity for civil liberties. Uh, I want to talk for a moment about the way that financial surveillance works right now in the United States. Um, I'm a U.S. lawyer, so a lot of my views are particularly uh, localized to the United States, and so I'm going to be talking specifically about U.S. law today, uh, just as a disclaimer. Um, but I want to take a moment to, to talk a little bit about the current surveillance measures in the U.S. that uh, the government imposes in the traditional banking world. Um, and how it conflicts not only with, in my view, international human rights law, but also how it seems to conflict with America's own Bill of Rights. So the U.S. Constitution requires that law enforcement obtain a warrant supported by probable cause before conducting a search or seizure. So why is it that in the traditional financial system in the United States, law enforcement can actually engage in mass surveillance of bank customers without a warrant. Um, this would seem, in my view, to be uh, contrary to the United States Constitution. Uh, the answer here is a thing called the third party doctrine. So this is the idea that people do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the data that they share with a third party like a bank. And in 1976, the U.S. Supreme Court held in a case called U.S. v. Miller that the Bank Secrecy Act uh, didn't violate the U.S. Constitution because of the third party doctrine. That Bank Secrecy Act is the same act that is being used 
still today to enable law enforcement to obtain a massive amount of financial records directly from banks um, and for banks to have to turn those over by default to the U.S. government, uh, even without a warrant. Um, but, you know, even in the 1970s, the Supreme Court justice who authored that Miller opinion wrote in another case that financial transactions can reveal much about a person's activities, associations, and beliefs. And at some point, government intrusion upon these areas would implicate legitimate expectations of privacy. So since Miller, that was in, 19, in the 1970s, the government has greatly expanded the Bank Secrecies Act reach. So in, the, in 1976, the government was looking at what the Bank Secrecy Act um, was doing then at that point and what law enforcement, what information law enforcement was obtaining at that point. Um, and I, I personally believe that if the Supreme Court looked at this again many years later, um, that they would actually find that the way that the Bank Secrecy Act is being applied right now, which is to say having massive amounts of customer records that are turned over to law enforcement without a warrant by default en masse um, would actually be found to be unconstitutional. Um, and the reason I think that is, is twofold. One is just that the Bank Secrecy Act has, has greatly expanded. And the second is that the amount of information that one can glean from financial records has just expanded exponentially since the 1970s. Um, the, you know, the amount of information that someone could get for, uh, from someone's bank records in the 1970s, uh, very, very little, whereas today it can really paint a 360 degree view of someone's life, of their political beliefs, of where they are physically located and who they associate with. Um, and these are the types of things that law enforcement is supposed to go get a warrant before they are able to, uh, before they are able to actually have that kind of information turned over from them. This is not something that in the United States, law enforcement is supposed to be able to get uh, for all citizens. So um, unfortunately, of course, this has not, this issue has not reached the US Supreme Court. So what we actually have right now is um, other, court cases that are looking specifically at this 1976 decision in U.S. v. Miller and finding that it's okay uh, to not only for, for the Bank Secrecy Act as it's applied in the traditional banking system to have those records turned over to law enforcement by default, but that it's also okay to do that in the context of cryptocurrency. Um, for me, I find that really problematic. Um, and so um, for me, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about a case from uh, last year that I, I found very troubling. Uh, so this was the Grapkowski case. Um, so this, um, this basically was a case where the US government had gone to a particular cryptocurrency exchange and without getting a warrant had asked them to send over information about a particular individual, Mr. Gratkowski. And this was in connection with a criminal investigation they were doing, but they didn't go through the trouble of going to get a warrant because they didn't have to. All they had to do was ask this particular cryptocurrency exchange, hey, uh, could you please hand over this information? And uh, they went ahead and handed over the information. Um, and so the, uh, Mr. Gratkowski challenged this in court um, and he said, you know, look, they, they, that's, it's great that they ha got that information, but they got that through, they got that through illegal means. They should have actually had to go and get that, a warrant in order to get those transaction records. And the court here held that the defendant actually didn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, in his cryptocurrency transaction records. And so um, the police didn't need to get a warrant uh, to see them. Um, and so that applied not only to the transaction record, but also the identity that was associated with this particular person's cryptocurrency uh, exchange account. Um, and for me, that isn't this decision um, uh, really isn't just important for individual criminal cases, right? This was a particular criminal case. This was um, uh, Mr. Gutkowski. And certainly if law enforcement had went and gotten a warrant, they ultimately would have been able to go and, and get that information. They just decided they didn't want to. And so here's why this case matters. The case matters because it means that the government 
because it doesn't have to get a warrant, uh, can just go ahead and partner with private companies to effectively implement mass surveillance programs, that the government can partner with, uh, with, with cryptocurrency exchanges in addition to the way that they've partnered with banks and other traditional financial institutions and have engaged in um, mass surveillance. So they can do that with cryptocurrency exchanges as well because they don't need to go get individual warrants in order to uh, get this type of information about individuals. And this sounds maybe a little paranoid, but we absolutely know that these types of partnerships happen. Um, EFF, where I serve as special counsel, um, has actually sued the uh, NSA in the United States for warrant, warrantless uh, mass surveillance of Americans that was in cooperation with AT&T, um, where they were uh, going and, and scraping a ton of AT&T's records. Um, and, and this, again, was enabled because they didn't need to go get a warrant for individual, uh, for individual transaction records. So now we have, uh, <laughs> now here we have um, the uh, court saying, um, uh, now we, here we have a court uh, saying that this, this can happen in the cryptocurrency context. Um, so this was something I found very concerning last year. And, and again, I truly believe that if this case, if, if, if these types of cases, not just in the cryptocurrency context, but also in the general financial context, were to make it back up to the United States Supreme Court, that it may actually turn out that the Supreme Court today says, you know what, actually, um, this is not what we had in mind in the 1970s when we said, uh, okay, you can you can get some information without a warrant. That that now today, with the amount of information available, that this is something um, that actually would require a warrant. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we we don't currently have a, a path to getting that decided. Um, but um, uh, very unfortunate about this this particular case, the Grabkowski decision last year. Um, I want to walk through some of the other updates in the cryptocurrency and privacy space um, and how I'm thinking about them. And um, for me, there's a, a big theme here, which is that over the course of the last uh, over the course of the last couple of years, but especially increasingly in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, uh, there has been a huge push from governments around the world, but especially from the United States government, to really take the mass surveillance that we're so used to in the traditional banking system and extend it to cryptocurrency. Um, I find this really concerning uh, and very problematic for civil liberties. So I'm going to walk you through some of the things that have been, been happening recently um, and, and how I'm thinking about them. So um, in October, uh, there was this uh, Department of Justice uh, in the United States, again, cryptocurrency enforcement framework. Um, and uh, the report, uh, in my view, had a lot of very sort of shocking positions, um, very, very strong positions that the Department of Justice was taking uh, about cryptocurrency. Um, and at the time, you know, we hadn't yet seen some of the later proposals. And so I think this was one of the sort of early warning shots in this space that what was going on uh, uh, was was sort of the beginning of a, a trend in uh, increasingly uh, moving mass surveillance to the world of cryptocurrency. So I'll give you some examples of what the Department of Justice said in this cryptocurrency enforcement framework. So first of all, they've made up a term called um, AECs, Anonymity Enhanced Cryptocurrencies. Um, and, and by this, they mean they specifically mentioned Monero and Zcash. Um, and they said that the Department of Justice considers the use of AECs to be a high risk activity that is indicative of possible criminal conduct. And that companies that choose to offer AEC products have increased risk of money laundering, et cetera. Um, they also said that websites or companies that offer mixing or tumbling services are engaged in money transmission and therefore have to actually register um, with the government um, and must collect customer identification information, uh, else the operators may be criminally liable for money laundering. Um, and so Again, this to me was a, a, a pretty, uh, pretty surprising and um, very 
very strong stance. Um, and this is something um, that we've we've seen before. Um, saying that this is indicative of possible criminal conduct, um, this is something, these are the types of arguments that we constantly see law enforcement agencies using when they're attacking encryption. Um, you know, I started off the talk by talking a little bit about um, this misconception that anonymity is bad and anonymity enables crime. And that's exactly what law enforcement is saying here. But in reality, um, in my view, uh, anonymity actually en enables and enhances civil liberties. And so for the DOJ to take these particular positions, in my view, was very, very problematic. Another thing they said uh, in the DOJ crypto enforcement framework in October, um, I found problematic for other reasons. So th they said that peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchangers are considered money services businesses and are subject to record keeping and reporting requirements. Um, and effectively that um, failing to register, um, you know, when you're, even when you're doing uh, P2P exchanges um, is something that uh, uh, is illegal. And that the idea that P2P exchanges actually need to be registering with the US government and need to engage in record keeping and reporting requirements, which is to say they need to be keeping track of a P2P, uh, you know, even in P2P transactions, they need to be keeping track of effectively who is uh, who, who their internet, who, who, are, who their customers are, who the people using uh, these, these P2P transactions are and, um, and what those transactions are and then reporting those out to the government. I found this extremely problematic specifically um, because it, you know, they seem to acknowledge that peer to peer, ex like the idea behind peer to peer is that you're allowing users to trade directly with one another. But nonetheless, they somehow think that there's something, some intermediary that's supposed to be registering with the government and is supposed to be um, complying with record keeping requirements. Uh, and for me, that's really, really problematic because you get to this question of, okay, well, who do they think is supposed to be doing that? Is it the people who's writing the code? Um, you know, is it, uh, is it the users themselves? Like, who are the people exactly who are going to be subject to these criminal penalties. Um, and so this is one of the areas where I see a couple of different areas intersecting. Um, we have these, these the, the governments increasingly pushing for these record keeping requirements. Um, and we have the government also um, uh, effectively uh, trying to impose this on peer to peer. Um, and, and that for me um, is, is a real problem. And uh, again, I'm a US lawyer, so I'm thinking about things through the lens of the United States. Um, but this reminded me quite a lot of a big problem that uh, we saw where um, uh, the SEC basically uh, charged the founder of a, a crypto uh, decentralized exchange, Ether Delta, um, with uh, operating an unregistered securities exchange. Um, and the issue here, uh, the EFF, uh, other folks at EFF and I um, took a look at the, the SEC's statements that it made in connection with bringing these charges. Um, and the issue was that they were talking about a particular decentralized technology. And so when they were trying to pin down, okay, well, who is it that's going to actually be on the hook for this? Um, they said that the, the issue here is that uh, EtherDelta's founder had written and deployed code, the EtherDelta smart contract, and that he should have known that that would contribute to violations of, of the SEC's uh, regulations. And he all, the SEC also wrote that a person who merely provides an algorithm, that was their language, provides an algorithm, could be providing a trading facility and would need to have a license before deploying that code. Um, at EFF, we took issue with that. Um, that, you know, there, there are, um, uh, uh, again, I'm talking specifically uh, about the United, about what, what's going on in the United States. 
Um, but uh, in the United States, we found that that type of language uh, raises some pretty serious First Amendment questions. Um, you know, the idea that someone could be liable here, um, specifically for providing an algorithm, um, violates one of the sort of basic uh, and, and uh, sort of tenets of uh, First Amendment law in this area, which is that code is speech. Um, and so uh, this sort of goes back to the Bernstein case, which is actually one of EFF's early cases, where the court found that forcing cryptographic researchers to obtain a license before publishing code was a violation of the First Amendment. Um, and the US requiring someone to get a license before speaking is a is a called a prior restraint on speech. And prior restraints are justified only in unusual and extreme circumstances. So if you restrict the ability to merely write and publish code, you can't that doesn't meet that level of scrutiny for prior restraints on speech. So um, uh, several of others at the EFF, uh, Rainey Reitman, Aaron Mackey and I um, wrote this long letter to the SEC, um, basically saying that um, requiring coders to obtain a license would be um, a violation of the First Amendment and that the language that they were using here um, was, was potentially very problematic. Um, but at the time, you know, we were talking about just a few sentences in this order, but it was really important for us because we realized that this could really be a glimpse into the future of regulators trying to put their finger on decentralized exchanges. Um, and indeed, fast forward, uh, you know, th this all happened uh, a couple of years ago, but fast forward a couple of years to the DOJ crypto enforcement framework. And suddenly we, we sort of have reached this place where the Department of Justice is taking positions that are particularly problematic um, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for privacy uh, and civil liberties. Um, so uh, I wanted to that, give that sort of backstory as to the things that I think are important um, around this issue of who's actually writing the code, because of course the question of liability um, is a huge one. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, things that uh, are, are sort of it, where it doesn't necessarily matter whether there's liability or not. Um, because one of the things that we've been seeing recently um, is that there's a growing list of cryptocurrency exchanges um, that include Shapeshift, um, and Lightbit and Bittrex, um, that we have seen delisting privacy coins like Zcash and Monero, um, and they're often citing pretty vague concerns about regulatory and compliance issues. Uh, and so here we're seeing something really interesting, which is, you know, even if there aren't particular, even if people aren't in particular uh, 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 liable for, for a particular thing, um, or even if there aren't laws on the books that anyone is particularly uh, violating, uh, the government is see, appears to be using soft power and or um, spreading uh, sort of fear, uncertainty and doubt such that it actually is making it uh, very difficult for exchanges to operate using anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies. Um, so we, we saw the DOJ enforcement framework language where they made up this whole uh, this whole um, three letter acronym AECs to describe Monero and Zcash and other anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies. Um, and suddenly it's very difficult for crypto exchanges um, to be listing um, those privacy coins. What's going on behind the scenes? Uh, I think there's a select group of people who knows uh, what's going on behind the scenes, and um, I hope one day we find out. Um, but in the interim, I'm I'm pretty concerned about this this trend of crypto exchanges uh, dropping privacy coins. Um, so another big another big big uh, sort of part piece of the story um, on on the U.S. government in particular pushing forward with trying to extend the traditional banking systems mass surveillance to cryptocurrency um, was around uh, Christmas. So it was last December, 
uh, and it was right the Friday before Christmas. Um, and this is, of course, right before the turnover uh, from the Trump administration to the uh, to the next administration, um, which was going to be turning over uh, a couple weeks later. Uh, the Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, drops the proposed rulemaking. And this rulemaking would require um, certain businesses like exchanges to keep records of cryptocurrency transactions over three thousand uh, dollars and to report those cryptocurrency transact any crypto cryptocurrency transactions over ten thousand uh, dollars to the government so essentially this expands the rules of the bank secrecy act to crypto exchanges um but um so they so they drop this and and you know these types of proposed rulemakings are, are relatively common but because it was the end of the administration, they were hoping to shove this through. And so they actually gave the entire industry only two weeks to comment. And this was the Friday before Christmas. So everyone's about to go out on vacation. And suddenly we have two weeks to comment on this, this massive proposed rule. So um, I think the industry really stepped up here. Um, EFF uh, submitted comments, but many, many others um, submitted submitted comments as well. And in EFF comments, we were specifically um, highlighting a couple of different points um, that we wanted to get through to FinCEN in trying to stop them from <laughs> moving forward uh, in two weeks with this, this sort of massive change. Um, you know, one, one place where um, it's a little tricky even within the cryptocurrency community is um, there are a lot of people who, including some some very well known and, and well respected um, uh, cryptocurrency policy shops that basically take the position: Look, if you're already regulating, uh, you know, the traditional banking in a particular way, go ahead and extend that to cryptocurrency. Um, so a lot of the comments that were submitted to FinCEN took this position of like. You know, you can you can implement some, you know, expanded surveillance of cryptocurrency as long as it's just what already exists in the financial system. Uh, for us, for EFF, um, we took a much stronger position. Uh, so our position was, first of all, um, actually the entire the entirety of the way that this is applied to other assets, not just cryptocurrency, the way that the Bank Secrecy Act is applied is unconstitutional period end stop. Um, so you certainly shouldn't apply it to cryptocurrency, but frankly, you shouldn't be doing this with traditional assets anyway. Um, but second, we made this argument that cryptocurrency data is different than regular data. And, and here's why. So, you know, purportedly what they're trying to say is, well, you know, you only have to keep transaction records over $3,000, and you only have to automatically report cryptocurrency transactions over $10,000 to the government. But here's the problem. As we all know, um, all of this transaction data is publicly and permanently recorded on a public blockchain in, in the case of, for example, Bitcoin. So this means that if you end up learning the identity of a particular user associated with a particular address, you're gleaning and you're able to glean information about them that goes way beyond just the transactions that are over $10,000 or over $3,000. Um, and so you, as a result of that, it really isn't possible in the cryptocurrency context to limit it the way that they are claiming to limit it to transactions over a particular uh, amount. Um, and so that was one of the arguments that we thought it was really important uh, to, we really thought it was really important to make um, and that, you know, many folks in the um, cryptocurrency legal community and myself included, um, you know, spent their holidays writing. Um, and there sort of was a um, uh, happy ending-ish to this. And I think there was a, a pretty big win here, which was um, they ended up, Vincent ended up getting, despite this two-week window over the holidays, so many, they got um, 4,000 comments. Um, uh, uh, I think just in the first uh, week and a half, and, and they ended up with uh, seven, I think 7,500 by the end of the two weeks. And uh, at that point, I think it was 
I think they sort of realized they couldn't say in good faith that they had actually, you know, looked through and had responded to all of this and could really get it through in those two weeks. Um, and so as a result, um, they had to postpone it, push it out to the new administration. They didn't end up um, implementing it and they have extended the, the deadline. They extended the deadline out initially to March and then they pushed it out again um, to the fall. So at this point, we don't know ultimately what's going to happen, but we did have a small win in that um, this particular uh, thing did not get um, pushed through. Um, as a, a sort of an additional piece, um, we saw um, FATF, which is the US, the, the uh, Financial Action Task Force, um, issue new draft guidance um, that would also, um, I think, be part of this larger trend in that it would dramatically expand the definition of financial intermediaries to capture a host of players in the DeFi ecosystem. Um, and this includes expanding the definition of virtual asset service provider or um, VASP. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of things to say about this particular FATF guidance um, and, and the many, many reasons that this is uh, highly problematic. But I wanted to just note that one of those is, in fact, um, this particular, that this is, in fact, part of the particular trend around privacy uh, issues um, in the cryptocurrency space. So um, I, I wanted to also make sure that we talked a little bit, not just about financial surveillance here, but also about uh, financial censorship. Um, so in this space, um, one of the things that is a, a, a huge problem that is, in my view, really not uh, sufficiently talked about um, is the extent to which payment intermediaries in the United States really serve as financial censors. Um, so there are um, many, many different types of folks who are having their, regularly having their accounts, financial accounts suspended, making it absolutely impossible for them to take, to make monetary transactions online. And so that includes, for example, WikiLeaks, which is one example, but it also includes things like adult booksellers or um, adult social networks uh, or other whistleblowers. Um, and so there are all these, there are all these examples of payment processors cutting off services to entities that are perfectly legal, but that, that they find unsavory. Um, you know, so imagine you're running an adult bookstore during COVID and Visa and MasterCard decide they aren't going to process payments to you. So how do you survive, right? How do you survive in that instance? Um, another big group that is often targeted here um, is, is sex workers. Um, but again, it's not just things that are um, allegedly illegal. It's also things that are, that are merely unsavory. Um, and so I think one of the things that's so important about cryptocurrency is its ability, its inherent resistance to financial censorship. The fact that it makes it harder for institutions to deny you service based on who you are just because they find you um, potentially unsavory. Um, so in January, um, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency uh, finalized a um, particular rule called Fair Access to Financial Service services. Now, this was um, this was by the, the then comptroller of the currency, Brian Brooks. Um, Brian was the former uh, uh, general counsel of Coinbase, and he is now the CEO of Binance US um, and a, a huge friend to the cryptocurrency space. Um, Brian was in as the comptroller of the currency of the United States for only a few short months, but I think he did more in those few short months for cryptocurrency um, than basically any other regulator has done in, in years and years in office. So um, really phenomenal regulator. And um, one of the things that I thought was really, uh, really an exciting development on the other side was that Brian proposed this fair access to financial financial services rule. And this would have basically prohibited um, banks from refusing to serve customers that they find politically or morally unsavory. And this is important because 
um, banks for many years have refused to serve entire industries on the basis of political disagreement. Um, and many other financial intermediaries, as we've discussed, have engaged in this mass financial censorship for projects that they think are controversial, even when they're engaged in protected speech. And I think for folks in the crypto space, we're all too familiar with these problems, right? Um, so it's often uh, the case that individuals working at legal US cryptocurrency businesses are denied personal banking services because of their employment. And this is a huge barrier for cryptocurrency entrepreneurs. And in my view, uh, whose uh, time and energy would be much better spent innovating rather than trying to figure out how to get a bank account. Um, so under this new OCC rule, um, banks would still be able to refuse to serve certain customers, but like only on an individual basis. Um, and that would be based on a customer by customer risk assessment rather than refusing to serve an entire industry such as the cryptocurrency industry. But unfortunately, um, like in one of the, the uh, strangest turns I've seen in the uh, this space, the rule got passed, but got went through, um, but mysteriously just didn't make it on to the federal register. Um, and so unfortunately, uh, the rule was sort of pocket vetoed through some sort of weird back end thing that um, no one really has any um, idea what happened. So um, it was a was this positive step forward, but unfortunately appears to have been mysteriously held. Uh, so I know we have um, just a few minutes left, but I, I just want to hit a few final points and really um, just underscore this last point, which is that a cashless society is a surveillance society. And the most important thing about cryptocurrencies uh, is their ability to import the anonymity of cash into the online world. Um, you know, I think we need the privacy and anonymity of cryptocurrencies in order to be able to buy and sell and trade freely in a digital economy. Um, and I think when we delist these cryptocurrencies or otherwise subject them to undue regulatory control and pressure, and when we impose overbroad measures to dismantle anonymous crypto transactions, we aren't uh, helping to take financial tools out of the hands of criminal actors, but instead what we're doing is we're depriving all internet users of the best means to protect their anonymity and privacy uh, when making transactions online. Um, so um, with that, um, I will wrap up. Thank you all so much for, for your time and, and, uh, and being here in person. Uh, and uh, thanks again so much for having me. Uh, so the short answer is no. <laughs> um, so we have certain intergovernmental agencies that, um, like, for example, that you'll, where you'll see that there are, um, um, so for, I, I think the, the one, one example of where you see, I, I didn't cover this in the presentation because there was limited time, um, but there's a, a thing called the travel rule. Um, and, and the travel rule is something that is uh, being implemented across a variety of, of, uh, of countries. Um, and um, so I think you see certain um, things that are implemented as like compliance best practices, um, similar to uh, similar to the, the travel rule. But I think the short answer is not really. Sure. Um, yeah. So how does this apply to folks outside the US? 
So, you know, I, again, because of limited time, I didn't cover this. But another thing that I thought was really, I, I mean, I have to tell you, when I saw the DOJ crypto enforcement framework, um, I was pretty shocked. Um, and one of the things that was really shocking is they took some really aggressive positions about where their, where their jurisdiction lies and, and sort of in what, you know, um, and they basically took the position, look, uh, anything that could affect the United States from like, for example, a terrorism perspective falls within our jurisdiction. So when you're talking about something like cryptocurrency, which could lead to a, you know, some sort of terrorist threats, we basically have jurisdiction everywhere. And I'm not even really exaggerating. That's effectively what they said. Um, you, know, you can go and, and, and look at the language and it's like, you know, pretty, pretty shocking to see them taking that position. Um, but I mean, you know, relatively um, shortly thereafter, um, you know, you've, you've definitely seen uh, 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 different entities uh, that, for example, in um, uh, uh, the, uh, oh God, how do you say it? Seychelles? Is that how you say it? Uh, you see a bunch of, you see, you've seen those types of, um, uh, you've seen the U.S. go into those types of places and, and, and actually assert their, um, assert jurisdiction over entities that are operating uh, in Seychelles and not in, in the United States uh, under that particular theory. Thanks so much.